Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Scott Rice from Crime Talk, and thank you for tuning in. Another busy docket today. First, stay-at-home orders. Are these legal, or are they a violation of one's constitutional rights? Second, headlines from across the country that will not restore your faith in humanity. Third, Letitia Stauk, Lori Vallow, Evelyn Boswell, and Megan Fairmuska court date updates. Fourth, my response to a comment left below in the comment sections after yesterday's question of how can you represent those horrible people. And fifth, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Scott Reich of Crime Talk, and thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you. We would not be here if it were not for you. Thank you for tuning in. If you have not already subscribed, we would ask you to please do so. Hit that little bell so that you receive notifications of when we put up new content. And as always, leave a comment below. First on the docket, stay-at-home orders. Are they legal? Across the country, many cities and states have issued stay-at-home orders. Now, the question becomes, and we briefly touched on this the other day, are they really legal? Does the governor have or the mayor have authority to simply say by executive order, I'm going to say that all people need to be at home? But of course, I'm going to give an exception. And as we talked about last week, When you actually read these stay-at-home orders, they are really rather hollow, and the press only seems to be actually stating that you can only leave your house if you're essential personnel. For example, most things come to mind if you're medical personnel, correct? Or that you need to be able to simply leave your house to obtain food. So when you start looking at some of these orders, and I'm telling you that a lot of these orders are exactly the same, and then they tell you exactly what essential personnel are. And I think it's a little surprising when you find out just about everybody is essential personnel, but yet the entire country or a good portion of it is being shut down. Other than restaurants that you cannot have somebody there, you cannot um, have gatherings uh, usually of 50 people or more, even if you're exercising social distancing, these orders they have so many exemptions, they're probably not going to hold up if challenged. And guess what? What if somebody wants to exercise their First Amendment right to practice their religion, and their religion necessarily includes being with other people to practice their religion, or their First Amendment right to uh, gather? Normally, the government cannot prohibit such things. And so a pastor at the river at the Tampa Bay Church Rodney Howard Brown, was arrested after a live streaming event showed that there were basically more people and they were not exercising social distancing rules at his service on Sunday morning. Apparently, the police had asked him not to do that. He persisted and said that he would, in fact, hold his services and that there were some four to 500 congregants reportedly gathered in the uh, mega church. The church issued a statement saying that we expect hospitals to have their doors open 24-7 to receive and treat patients. We expect our police and firefighters to be ready and available to rescue and to help and keep the peace. The church is another one of those essential services. It is a place where people turn for help and comfort in a climate of fear and uncertainty. Now, Brown was charged with unlawful assembly in violation of a public health emergency order. And the problem is for the government, when they actually charge somebody under an ordinance or an executive order, it's not anything, it's not a law that has been passed by the legislature. It's the governor saying, I'm declaring a public emergency, we're going to shut you down. But those orders usually have to be for a limited time period, very limited in scope. It's, for example, if they go in and they find a restaurant that is filthy on the inside, they can shut it down for public health reasons. They can 
pull their license if they give them due process, but they can't shut them down indefinitely. They have to let them do their thing and clean it up. So it has to be limited in time, scope, and limited in purpose as well. And a law firm, the Liberty Council, which is a nonprofit law firm who's representing Pastor Howard Brown, said that the Hillsborough County Administrative Order has so many exceptions it looks like Swiss cheese. They added that the precautions were taken in the church, such as a six-foot distancing and a hospital-grade purification system. So those are two facts that we haven't heard from anybody else in the news media. I'm a little surprised they haven't to state that precautions were being made, just that, oh, there were people here. And that's the problem with these orders. They don't take into any type of exceptions that are there, let alone one's First Amendment right to participate and practice uh, their religion. And when you have so many exceptions to for people that are basically not essential, I mean, it's either going to be everybody's locked down or nobody's locked down. Now, I get it. We encourage you all to use your common sense. Stay at home if you can stay at home. Clean your hands. Wash your hands. Hand sanitize your hands. Stay away from people that are sick. If you think you're getting sick, stay away from people. If you think they're sick, stay away from people. We get that. We really do. But at a certain point, someone is going to say enough is enough when you have people that have literally been put out of business and they have no idea when they're going to be back in business or be able to hire their employees back. That just keeps going on. And I'm not saying things are going to get scary. I hope they don't. But in Italy, they're already having rioting issues. Now we have people that have been out of work in some places for two, three weeks already that haven't been able to work, don't have rent payment. And yes, people are saying that you're not going to be evicted. Yes, we're going to help you out the much as much as you can. But at some point, people are going to say, we've had enough. And that's where our politicians are going to have to say, these are enforceable orders that you have to comply with, or are they simply recommendations? Because that's really what they are now, given the so many exceptions. I don't know what the right answer is. Something to think about. Let me know in the comments what you think. Next on the docket, some headlines from across the country that will not restore your faith in humanity. You just really have to wonder what in the hell is going on in the world today. From Gunterville, Alabama, two women charged with sexually abusing nursing home patients. Just when you thought it couldn't get worse for nursing homes and their news. That's right. Two CNAs, Ashley Johnson, 32, and Anna Scoggins, 26, were indicted Tuesday in connection with the alleged sexual abuse of five residents while they were employed at the Marshall Manor Nursing Home in Guntersville. Johnston was charged with two counts of first-degree sexual abuse, three counts of public lewdness, two counts of third-degree elder abuse, and one count each of harassment and indecent exposure. Scroggin was charged with two counts of first-degree sexual abuse, five counts of second-degree voyeurism, and one count each of public lewdness and third-degree elder abuse. There's not much detail given about the alleged acts, but one can only imagine given that it was, in fact, at a nursing home. Both Johnson and Scroggins were booked in, in custody, and their bond was set at $70,000 cash property or surety. I don't know. What, what do you say about that? You just don't know. Police in Virginia are searching for the person or persons responsible for the murder of a 33-year-old woman whose body was found in a wooded area of Roanoke. Cassandra Pizzi has been identified as the woman whose remains were discovered. Police have not yet disclosed how she died. However, the authorities are treating the case as a homicide. Pizzi was the mother of a 12-year-old boy. The police continue their investigation to try and determine who perpetrated this killing. If anyone has any information... 
they should contact the tip line at 540-344-8500. Maybe someone out there in YouTube world or land knows something about this case and can help bring the uh, suspects to justice. And yet another terrible case. More than a year after a newborn baby's body was found inside a cooler that had been dumped along the side of a road in Georgia, DNA evidence has led to the arrest of a woman who was allegedly the child's mother. Caroline Propes, 19, of Newman, Georgia, was charged with second-degree murder for the alleged role in the death of the baby. Now, this gruesome discovery took place on January 6th of 2019, and the child was in a zippered, insulated bag on wheels with watermelon print and had been on the side of the road for more than a week. Ultimately, DNA from the deceased baby was analyzed and used to determine that Propes to be the biological mother. Does this sound familiar to the Brooke Schuyler Richardson case in Ohio where she was ultimately found not guilty of murdering her newborn baby? Unfortunately, this may sound very, very similar, and I guarantee that the defense attorney who is going to represent this young woman is more than likely going to consider that as a possible defense because the authorities cannot determine cause of death. A Florida mom charged after leaving two-year-old in a hot car to go shopping. Marcia Owigo, 20, had allegedly been shopping for 25 minutes before she was called over the store's public address system. Upon returning to her car, she was met by police officers who stated that the two-year-old in the car was in an unsafe condition and that they had been waiting out there for at least 17 minutes to rescue the girl who had been sweating but appeared ultimately to be unharmed. Miss Owigo thought that she had only been shopping for just a few minutes and promptly returned to her vehicle when paid to do so. It was reported that the outside temperature was 85 degrees, but the temperatures inside the car was about 113 degrees. Hopefully, the child is okay, and hopefully Miss Owigo, although young, takes some uh, parenting classes and realizes that when you have a small child, they go everywhere with you, even when you're tired, even when the baby is sleeping. It's just the part of being a parent. So if that doesn't destroy uh, your faith in humanity, I don't know what will. Next on the docket, let's give you a quick update on other cases that we're following. The Letitia Stouck case. Now, her next court hearing is set for April 14th at 3 p.m. Although that date has been set, I can tell you, as someone who practices law here in Colorado, just about everything that has been set in April has been continued. We'll continue to monitor that because, frankly, we just see this case getting continued. I'm having most of my cases set far into May and some even early June. That's how bad the courts are uh, feeling the effects of the whole coronavirus. In the Lori Vallow matter, the judge has set a preliminary hearing for May 7 and 8. This was continued as both the attorney for Ms. Vallow and the prosecution were requesting the delay. The Evelyn Boswell case. Well, Megan Boswell has a hearing in Sullivan County Criminal Court on May 8th. Her mother, Angela Boswell, and her boyfriend, William McLeod, also face a sundry of criminal charges that we talked about last week. Those include the charge of theft of a stolen vehicle during the course of this investigation. They also got shoplifting. And then Angela Boswell had the burglary count uh, added yet again, while she's all on bond doing it at the same time. Curiously enough, no charges have yet been filed in relation to Evelyn's death. In regards to the Megan Fairmuska matter, the next court date for Megan Fairmuska, who's been charged with capital murder in the death of Heidi Broussard, has been postponed yet again and is now set for April 3rd. Now, yesterday we asked a question, and we discussed it, that I get oftentimes. How do you represent guilty people? Well, it's the Constitution. Well, one of the comments below, and I'm the 
first one to uh, take on criticism. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But a subscriber basically questioned and says, oh, that's what defense attorneys always do. Just say we're defending the Constitution. And they wanted to know, both morally, how can you zealously defend an evil person? And they go on to say they can't tell you how many times when the most reasonable people have seen a mountain of evidence and that someone has committed a crime and there's many evil deeds, and then some slime bag lawyer comes in and puts the victim on trial, just runs their name through the dirt, traumatizes a heartbroken family, and do it all with a smile on their face. And then when this person is acquitted and maybe goes out and commits yet another crime, how does the the defense attorney do this? And this particular uh, commenter, I'm not sure if they're a subscriber, but the comment uh, basically said, I call bullshit. So Mr. Reich, I implore you to answer the above question and maybe detail some of the reasons one might do something that is of the things that I've outlined above. Well, let me tell you this. We talked about it yesterday. Everyone is entitled to a counsel. If you want to see the full explanation, hit a link below. Go see yesterday's video. It's that simple, all right? It's called the Constitution. And guess what? Anytime you have a lawyer who goes in there and is zealously representing a client, they don't have a complete free-for-all. The attorneys are limited both ethically as to what they can do. They just can't make up complete nonsense. There has to be a good faith basis for running somebody's name through the mud, okay? And additionally, even because that information is out there, it still has to pass the test of legal admissibility. So assuming a judge, right? Does anybody ever say the judge did a terrible job because somebody walked free because he followed the law? No, I can't recall of a particular time where that takes place, right? So those questions that come from the defense attorney, those have to be legally permissible under the law, approved by the judge, even if they're objected to by the prosecution. So those things about running people through the mud, it's not running people through the mud. That's called facts, and they have to be relevant to be admissible. And even if they're admissible, the court still has to do a balancing test under 403, which says the probative value is still greater than the prejudicial effect of the question. So you don't get to just run people through the mud and say, ooh, they're a terrible person. You have to have a good faith basis for it. You don't get to run the family through the mud. You have to have a good faith basis for it. And the judge wouldn't allow it if it didn't exist. So stop this crap that I get about, oh, defense attorneys are evil and bad. They're doing their job, and if you were charged wrongfully with a crime, you would be calling a defense attorney, and you would want the best one that you could get, that you could afford, whether they were court-appointed or not, you would want one, okay? So please stop the, how do you morally do it? Well, guess what? Do you say that to the priest that, that that gives uh, penance to a, a killer who finds God? You don't. You say, oh my God, the priest helped him find God. Do you say that to a doctor who helps save somebody that's committed an illegal act or a terrible bad act or somebody thinks is a bad person? No, you don't. They do it because they have a Hippocratic oath to do no harm, to help people regardless of whom they are, right? So that's what attorneys are doing as well. And they're representing their clients. And guess what? The next time you say, oh, there's a mountain of evidence out there and everybody knows that they're guilty, why do we have these attorneys doing what they do? Then ask yourself, go back and Google, how many people have been released from prison because they were wrongfully convicted. Why? Oh, that's right. But but they had that mountain of evidence. But the government got it wrong. And thank God the attorneys in the appeal and the post-conviction process were there so that an innocent person didn't spend any more time in jail than they absolutely had to. So the next time somebody gets on their moral high ground about attorneys representing somebody, you know, stop and ask yourself, 
Would you morally want somebody to stay in prison for something they didn't do because you think there's a mountain of evidence and they got it wrong? Think about that. Next on the docket, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. An unidentified man from Lakeland, Washington, hit two cars on two separate occasions and failed to stop both times, leading state troopers on a high-speed chase up Interstate 5. The police called the driver's conduct absolutely reckless, and the speeds hit about 110 miles per hour throughout the chase. The driver, in his attempt to elude police, drove on a trail for pedestrians and bicyclists, and fortunately did not hit anyone. Eventually, troopers were able to use a spike strip to end the pursuit, and when the driver gave his explanation of why he was driving the way that he was, he said, quote, he was trying to teach his dog how to drive, end quote. The spokesmen for the Washington State Troopers are kind of like what I feel about this case. You just can't make this stuff up. You just can't make this stuff up. So this unidentified man, you are our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Why? Because that is the dumbest answer anyone could possibly give for an eluding. I appreciate the uh, initiative of trying not to admit that you were, in fact, the driver, but that is just poor judgment. It would have been better had you simply remained silent. For you, spouting the dumbest answer I've ever heard on an eluding case, you are our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Have a great day. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Do all that social distancing stuff because we want everyone here to watch Crime Talk. Have a great day.